Without further ado, uh, the people we have up here, very important. So you're free to ask questions, so do raise your hand. This is not a traditional format. Uh, just imagine like a TED Talk meets a master's class. So you always can ask a question. I'll kind of moderate with the questions, but you're really going to see more of a conversation just happening amongst peers uh, going through different things. So. If you don't mind initially, Mr. Hagman, if you can just kind of give us an introduction, tell us briefly about the Knight Foundation and why you guys decided to support Digital Grass will be a great thing to know. You bet. You bet. Michael. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Okay, great. Well, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, the It was, Michael, to the, to this. We're on a journey, right? Yes. And uh, with uh, our previous event uh, across the street at WeWork, uh, we had the, the uh, little, you know. Bomb threat. Little, <laughs> yeah, bomb scare that, uh, uh, that sort of delayed things a little bit. And this morning, uh, uh, getting across the causeway, but, but we're here. And it's, an, and it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be here. Um, at Knight Foundation, about three years ago, uh, we launched an effort along with our work in the arts and journalism and media innovation. Um, to focusing on entrepreneurship and focusing on ways to help build Miami's emerging uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem and what thinking about ways that we can provide the resources and the platforms and create a network in which it is easier for all of you, all of us, to, to build and pursue the ideas that we want to pursue, right? And thinking that a healthier community is one where each one of us can pursue the ideas that we think are in our own best interests. Right? And as people can, can pursue what they want to do, that's a healthier community. Right? And so over the last three years, we've made a series of different grants around trying to help provide mentor networks, act better access to funding, cool events such as this one for connection and convening and learning, uh, access to talent, among other things. Um, and at the heart of that effort is Digital Grass. Uh, under Michael's amazing leadership, um, digital grass is what really what's ultimately, I think, at the, what will be our sort of determination of our success or not. Uh, and that's of ultimately what we, uh, we see our work in Miami and building Miami startup ecosystem. Our great differentiator, right, our, the thing that will separate us from other startup communities around the world is l effectively leveraging our unique diversity across Miami. Right. The more that we can create a startup ecosystem that has on-ramps from across the community where anyone who wants to be part of it can, and as they, as we each pursue the, or the own ideas that we want to pursue, that anyone can do that, right? And the more that we create connection and collision of people of different backgrounds, of different daily concerns and challenges, different life experiences, ultimately the richer the set of the ideas that are created, right? And ultimately the greater the impact. And that is our great competitive advantage in Miami. And so what is key is, as we work on this together is f creating more and more ways in which we connect across the community. And Digital Grass is leading that effort. And Michael is leading that effort. And it's our great honor, really, at Knight Foundation to be able to support a great entrepreneur like Michael uh, and a great organization like Digital Grass. So with that, it's an honor to be here. And it's an special honor to actually be able to share a table with a dear friend and an entrepreneur who I am a huge fan of and I admire. I find myself admiring more from Instagram posts because <laughs> she's like all over the world. Uh, but to be here with Dawn is such an honor and a privilege. So thank you. Perfect segue. Go ahead, Dawn. Introduce yourself. I think I have a mic. Oh, yeah, you got one. Okay. Hello. It's the boss mic. <laughs> Um, good morning. I don't think you, I need the mic, but my name's Dawn Dixon. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, my claim to fame right now is flat out of heels, which are rollable flats for women. Rescue your feet when you are in heels for hours and they hurt. And I have a vending machine and club live selling my flats. And I just want to plug Teach Hill, uh, Derek. <laughs> I would be nothing without this man here. No, I'm, I'm joking. But really, I would be nothing without my amazing network of entrepreneurs, so I'm really just grateful to be here, and to Mike for having me, I mean, he's another amazing person in, in my network, and, and 
everyone that I've seen that's going to be speaking to you guys over the next few days is just awesome. So again, it's, it's an honor for me to be here among, among my peers and people that I admire and <coughs> to be a part of something wonderful and amazing that DG Grass is doing and it's just a great to be here. Thank you. Teach? Hey. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Hey, good morning. Um, my name is Derek Turton, also known as Teach in the marketplace. Um, most people know me. I managed uh, Pitbull for 13 years from the beginning of his career until about last year. And then um, I broke off and just started trying to just focus on um, building my own brand, my own legacy. Um, so I recently started uh, Chef Teach House and Matt. I, 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 uh, I did a food truck and it's been doing really well in, um, in the marketplace. And then I also have uh, Conceptual Reality Media, which is a uh, um, content curation. And I'm also vice president of um, Polo Grounds Music, which is a subsidiary of uh, Sony. So ASAP Rocky, ASAP Ferg. So I kind of got my hands on a lot of different things. But my, my entrepreneur effort right now is uh, Chef T. Johnson Mac. All right. So the name of this topic, guys, was It Was All a Dream. So for the next 15, 20 minutes, my goal really isn't to moderate. I'll just throw a couple of questions out there so you guys can kind of run with the conversation. Um, I'm an adjunct professor for today, so just imagine I have the notes for the professors. So they're going to teach you everything, and we'll just go through this. So now we'll address you as Professor Hagman, huh? Professor Dixon, and I'm Thank still going to call you Professor Teach. I'm not calling you by your other last name. It's Teach. Yeah, you're Teach. You're Sorry. Teach. You will always be Teach. <laughs> you are here to teach us today. Um, first question. If I knew then what I know now, what would I have done differently? Talking about chasing your dreams. Wow, okay, well, you know, it's a constant, constant learning. So I'll just touch on, so I've been an entrepreneur for 16 years full time, but I'll really touch on flat out because it's my most recent and most challenging um, business venture to date. So um, it's a consumer product and it's, it was my first time bringing a product to market because I previously came from service, which where I was a product, people paid for my consulting services, for my knowledge. It didn't really take a lot of money for me to get the business going and keep the business um, profitable and market the business because I was the product. When it, when it came to a physical product, just the, the, the development from concept to actually production to getting it on the shelves, it's a very long process and it, it, it definitely is um, very challenging. So, I think the number one thing when I heard this question is if I knew then what I know now, it would be more focusing on the, the go-to-market strategy. For some reason, we always think when you get a product, and this is, this is everyone's first even comment to me, are you going to be in the big stores? Are you going to be in Target? Are you going to be in Macy's? Are you going to be in all these big box retailers? And you know, for me, that was the first thing I tried to do because naturally, you envision your product on the shelves, physically on the shelf, and that's like the I made it moment. So I spent a lot of time, resources, money in the beginning trying to get my product, which is a, well, at the time was a very new, unknown product on the shelves of these major big box retailers. And I, I exhausted a lot of resources, time, and money realizing that that's not the right go-to, that wasn't the best go-to market strategy for me. Um, if I knew then what I know now, I would have focused 100% in the beginning on e-commerce. And even though um, so many uh, advanced technology have been created since five years ago when I started Flat Out that make it a lot easier to market your product online, including you know, uh, influencer marketing, um, tons of different customer relationship management software, tons of uh, content management software that is out there online, I definitely would have focused, you know, I could, I could tell you now I probably spent or lost about $50,000 just trying to get into a big box retailer, and I'm still not in one. And, and that's not even my, um, you know, it probably makes up 10% of my business, uh, boutiques. But mainly it's, it's e-commerce. And so that would be my advice to anyone. If, you're take, if you want to have a physical product, go to market online first, build your customer base, get a proven market, and then make the retailers come to you because it's very expensive to go out and get retailers, whether it be 
the cost that that it that it uh, that you incur going to trade shows, with the travel, with the expenses, with the booth, with the materials, and all you need to sell, with hiring sales reps, with the UPC and the barcodes. I mean, barcodes are very expensive. So if you just want to have a product and put it on the shelf, you need a unique barcode, which is at least, I mean, if you have 20 SKUs or more, it's like three to five thousand dollars. So with so many things that you just don't know until you know and you usually find out in the clutch moment when it's like do or die. So if I knew then when I know now, we'll focus on e-commerce, get into you know, a certain number of trailing revenue and then expand to big box later. And uh, Teach, why don't you go ahead and touch on that? Um, well for me, it's a little bit different because I work <coughs> with musicians and artists and there's no cookie cutter approach like because what works for one person might not work for somebody else so i don't know like what i didn't know yesterday or what you know wh what i would have done differently it's it's it's, it's kind of it's, it's kind of a, a tricky question for me because that's what makes kind of the journey like when i first started working with pitbull dude was like a, a ufo like you got a, a cuban white boy from down south that you know what i mean like everything that wasn't popular at the time um, we had to try to find a way to make it work and when I work ASAP Rocky it's you know he's a trendy it's, it's just it's just different so it's just kind of I got to figure it out I got to figure it out I have to be able to adapt and, and learn as I go it's it's not um, you know what worked for one person might not work for another person as far as the food truck um, if I could have done anything differently, I bought, when I first purchased the truck, you know, I, I went to culinary school uh, 20 years ago, and then I kind of revisited it now, and I wanted to do a restaurant, but I didn't have, um, you know, half a million dollars to start the restaurant. So I, I, I invested 100000 into the, to my food truck, but I bought a used food truck. And then the thing with that was um, you, you build a whole business model around a vehicle that you try to cut the corner on, uh, you know, saving with a used truck, but then when it breaks down, you can't operate at all. So if I would have did anything differently as far as the truck, I would have purchased a used truck. I mean, I would have purchased a new truck that wouldn't have the problems that it has. And, and so, you know, because I've spent three times what I would have spent on the truck trying to save money, trying to cut those corners in the beginning. So, I mean, I guess kind of the answer is like, if, you know, if, if you're going to do things, try to do things right the first time, don't try to cut the corners because you're end up paying for them down the line. To, to build on that, certainly I think that the, um, the biggest insight so far has been the whole, the whole notion of learning as you go. Um, that the, you know, the, the trap to not fall into is sort of here's the plan and we tried out the plan and it either works or it doesn't. You know, it's here's our idea, uh, we're going to begin testing it right away and to begin to have feedback in terms of what's working and what's not and then changing and learning as we go just because you know, certainly the, what we've uh, learned is that you know we don't know we don't know and leaving room for that sort of learning and there can be different ways to do that right I mean for example in, in our work at Knight Foundation making grants you know in some cases you just make like one big grant that's kind of it there's not a lot of room for learning it's just sort of it works or it doesn't whereas you start sort of smaller you give this get an understanding of what's working in different ways you can do it better and then you sort of can grow from there and I think that's sort of been our I'm not control one of our most important insights but just to give some some context you know it was about it was you know four years ago when I got to Knight Foundation and the marching orders were go talk to people uh, for four months and come back and tell us what we should do next in Miami right and so that was sort of the um, that was that was where the journey started and, and, and talking to people and thinking about okay you know which what's that next thing what's that next thing that that where trends are converging in, in an important way where in this case Knight Foundation where, where we could be helpful um, and so ultimately obviously as I mentioned hit upon this whole notion of using Knight Foundation dollars to help try and build this, this startup ecosystem um, is that me to help try and, and build this startup ecosystem, but it's been in terms of doing it, right? The whole the the process has been an iterative one, and it's been one of just constant learning as we go, um, and even as we head now into next year, now three years into this, um, of of continually changing, and so we know that sort of where we started on this journey is certainly not where we're where we're going to end, and really embracing that. Well, and then I, I just wanted to, um, like, 
part of my drive, and when you talk about like, um, I think a lot of people going into ventures or going into things, it's like this fear of like what I should and what I shouldn't do. And like part of my drive is to kind of connect with things and brands that, or do things that people have never really done like that before. So a lot of the ventures I've gone into over the last 15, 20 years, it's like, you know, it's been things that haven't been done. So there's really no blueprint. And that's part of the journey and part of the challenge for me to to try to define it. And, you know, if, if somebody after me could be like, okay, Teach did this, or he didn't do this, or he did this right, he did that. You know what I mean? But like that's, I don't want to be regular. I, I don't want to. I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. I want to try to, you know, do the uncharted waters. I want to, you know, um, Easy VIP. Um, I had 10% equity in that. You know what I mean? Oh. But like I was one of the early believers. I introduced him to Dame. Like I'm, 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 I've been involved in a lot of things that you know when when nobody saw what Pitbull was, you know, 15 years ago. Like I saw that and I, I believed in it and nobody couldn't tell me, you know, and that dude hosted American Music Awards two years in a row, you know what I mean? But I saw that 15 years ago. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, the, the thing, well, I guess I'm not afraid of like the what I did or what I didn't do right or whatever, I'm not afraid to take the chances. So, you know, I'm not afraid to lose, I guess. So I'm not, that, that's, that's part of the reason why I've been able to be successful at a lot of things that I do. You know, the, um, with the, uh, the IPO yesterday of, of Square, I don't know if y'all saw, you know, the mobile payments company. Yeah. You know, the, the, I'm thinking a little bit about how that, that whole thing started, right? That entrepreneur lives here in Miami now. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the way he describes it as he hit upon that idea just because he was trying to solve a problem in his own life. You know, he had this glass blowing factory and lost a sale uh, because he couldn't process a credit card. Right? And so it wasn't even like he was, you know, thinking, oh, well, I'm going to do this sort of next big sort of tech thing, the IPO and, and the New York Stock Exchange and all that, it was, I couldn't sell a, like a, a vase or a glass or something. And because I couldn't sell that, I wanted to solve this problem. And then he, that started him down the path of thinking about a new way that small business owners could make a, you know, could make a sale. Um, and then, you know, I think that was in 2009, 2010, and then just yesterday they IPO. But it was, it's interesting how that all started was, just solving a problem in his in his own life, and discovered that it's a problem a lot of other people want to solve too. I guess. Oh, go ahead. So, did any of you work in corporate America before starting? I think one of the fears that most people have is that they do have a corporate job, leaving it behind, and then starting something new. So, did any of you think about that route or was it strictly? I did. I um I went to the Ohio State University, and. Um, I, uh, my first job out of college was working as a marketing manager for Nationwide Insurance. And I worked there um, for about eight months before I quit and realized I need to be an entrepreneur. It just, it just wasn't for me, but I think it's so valuable, <coughs> I, I will say. Um, working for, you know, Fortune, I think 100 corporation and being in the position that I was in, I was definitely the youngest person in management, reporting directly to the vice president of the, of the um, subsidiary that I worked for gave me so much valuable experience and information on how to run a business. And um, just learning how corporations are, how formed, how, you know, just from just everything you learn in corporate America from, you know, the core values, having employee manuals, like just how to do things, how to run a, how to run a business. So when I started Flat Out, I never thought of it as a small business, even though like technically it is. And, you know, you're a small business and you have like some crazy amount of employees, 500 employees, but I always thought of it as a major corporation and I said run it now like a major corporation so that when you do really get big, you don't have to totally revamp the entire organization because you're not prepared to scale. So it's definitely important to have all those processes in place. And then after I worked at Nationwide, um, I also did consulting and, and I, was a, I was the assistant to um, two, to uh, one CEO and owner of a newspaper, and I was I was the assistant to a, a director of development for a nonprofit. And being an executive assistant really sharpened my skills as a CEO because essentially, as executive assistant, you are doing all the CEOs' work for them. <laughs> so I mean, it was definitely very important for me to, to have those skills and work and be be an employee and be in in a corporate system before jumping out here.
because of the level of business that I that I operate on now. I mean, if I wasn't mentally prepared and didn't have some of those skills, I don't think that I would be successful at leading you know my different ventures if I didn't. So I think it's important. Um, I worked for Sony um, up until this year. I had a six-figure contract, but like I managed Pitbull, right? And then I know as a manager what I was getting with my percentage that I was making off of him. And then I'm working at this, you know, I'm, I'm making six figures, right? But I'm pretty much managing, artist manager. I know what my value was. So it was just, even though I was making money, it wasn't what I know I should be making. And on top of that, I just wanted to just focus on building my own legacy and building my own brand. So I took a chance with myself. And I'm, that's the best thing I ever did in my life. Why now? I mean, I don't know. I mean, timing. I mean, it, you know, I, I think things happen at the time they're supposed to happen because the money that I make selling food now versus, you know, I'm, I'm making money that I was making when I was working with Pitt selling chicken and waffles, right? And, you know, I could say, well, I wish I would have known this and I wish I would have started doing this back then. But, you know, the timing, you know, everything happens when it's supposed to happen because things are falling in place the way that they're supposed to fall in place. So, I mean, I don't have an answer why then versus now. I don't, I don't, maybe I wasn't ready or I don't, I don't know. But, you know, things are, things are happening the way they're supposed to happen for me now. So, so, um, so Knight Foundation is the first sort of corporate environment I've worked in. Previously, I was a, I was a reporter. I worked at you know, the Miami Herald. So it was the, sort of an odd leap, you know, going from one to the next. Um, the, but to your question, so no, I wasn't previously didn't have a corporate background, but to your to your question, something I've been thinking about is like in my current role, I'm thinking, okay, so if I were, so you know, an entrepreneur launching a startup, you know, like Dawn, like Teach, um, I'm thinking about like, okay, what would I sort of, what would I be doing, like right now at my my job at Knight Foundation, right? Like for example, yesterday I was talking to this entrepreneur. He's telling, and so, you know, obviously when you're doing a startup, there's just such a small room for error, even though you've got to be in a lot of experimentation, but you have to sort of maximize your time in such important ways and, so, and, you know, and be very clear in what you're working on. And so yesterday I was, was talking to this entrepreneur, he was telling me about how, you know, he starts every week with his, the other people on his team, and they do the stand-up, you know, scrum, you know, for all you guys and, you know, programmers and stuff, familiar with, you know, around sort of agile, um, planning and stuff. Um, the, and he says they do a stand-up and they say, okay, and each person has to say what they're doing for that week in just like two minutes. Uh, and then they actually have, they, and they have it on post-its and then they have sort of what they're working, what they want to do, what's being worked on, what's done, and then they move them and they meet every, um, every morning for you know, five minutes during the week, and the end of the week, it's like, okay, what's been done? They actually have a board where they're sort of, where they have on, on the three categories on post-its, they move them across. Um, and it's just a way with with limited number of people, limited number of hours to try and be hyper, you know, efficient and effective, right? And so, and I'm thinking, you know, in a world where I'm, what I'm doing right now at Knight Foundation, what if we were to apply those very same, you know, sort of principles, right? Or I'm thinking to myself, what if I just didn't even have an office? How would I do this? And I think, you know, and there are really great ways to do it. So at least for me, I've been thinking about sitting in a corporate environment right now, how can you sort of borrow from the principles or even sort of experiment with the principles that are, their practices that are required of being a journalist if I ever was to go out on my own and do something like this. Yeah, yeah. Do with that part, you sure? Well, I think one of the biggest things I've always heard entrepreneurs ask is, <coughs> that transition. When did you realize, I mean, even with you, Matt, because even though you're working with a foundation, you're still doing a lot of entrepreneur work because you're almost like an advisory board member to everybody that has corporations that's coming under you. Yeah. So for you guys, I guess, and these are like questions we pre we got in advance from other people that were a part of our team. How did you transition from an idea, a dream to the actual execution? You know, was it something that was out of passion or was it a demand? Like, how did you make that transition and how did you know you were taking that dream into an actual business? Um, I'll, yeah, so for me, um, 
I'm big on research, and that's really, you know, it's so important to, when you have a dream, like we all get great, great ideas. I felt like the night that I was out, my feet were hurting, and I'm like, there should be a vending machine because my feet are killing me. I should be able to buy some flats. I mean, that's a great idea. We have great ideas every day. But it's a matter of really doing the research to see, is this a viable business? Can I make money from this? Because if, it's no point starting a business that's not going to make money, and that you can't even figure out how. I think that's the number one thing. A lot of entrepreneurs have a great idea, but they don't know how to monetize it. They don't know how to, how to take it to the next level. So it started with research. So for me, you know, it was a dream. It was a vision. First, I wanted to know if anybody else thought it was a good idea. It didn't make any sense to anybody but me. So um, I did a survey. I created a survey on SurveyMonkey. I said, if I can get 100 people to just take, take this survey, just some basic questions. How long can you last in heels? Would you carry some shoes with you? Have you walked barefoot? If there were some shoes that you could, how much would you pay for them? What would you want? Like, let me know if this is a good thing. And I got people, I got 100 people from posting it on Facebook and asking my friends to just forward this survey out. It's 10 questions. Let me just know if I'm not crazy. So, okay, I had, 100, I had maybe like 130 people respond. I got some good data. And then I wrote a business plan. And, and the business plan isn't for anybody but yourself. You know, entrepreneur, uh, investors don't read your business plan. They will not read it. It's too long. They want to see an executive summary. They want to see a deck that's 10 pages. So the business plan is for you, in this case for me, so that I can really outline everything. Who's, you know, what are, what's, what's the marketing plan? Who are the competitors? Um, you know, what's the strategy? Who's my target customer? How do I reach that customer? What's customer acquisition costs look like? What's the budget look like? How would I manufacture these? And as I'm answering these questions, I'm doing so much research. And it helps to give me the groundwork for the business. So that's how I took the dream to, to make it, bring it to life, to bring <coughs> it down in writing. And, and that's something that's just for anything you want in life, even if not a business. If you want something, write it down. Take the step of actually writing it down and seeing it in front, in front of you and visualizing it. So once I wrote the business plan, of course, I had to figure out how I was going to fund it. But it was very detailed plan. And I went to my, my immediate close network, Teach being one of those people, <laughs> and said, hey, you know, I have this really great idea. I don't have any money. Can you, you know, invest in this idea? And I had close friends um, over the, the first year invest about $100,000 into it. Right away, a good friend gave me 10000 which allowed me to immediately go register my name, get my trademark, and get all of my website and everything. So it's important to just protect your brand from the very beginning and just go from there. And, you know, I'll stop there because I don't want to talk the whole time, but a business plan is something that's always evolving. So also just don't be too attached to it. Just write the plan out because it's a, it's a, it's a map for you, a road map. But as you go on any road, there's bumps. There's things you have to you have not turn off. So as you grow in business, that business plan changes. Mine's changed three times and it's changing again now. So. It's just something for you to be able to, the dream is still going and I'm rewriting it and tweaking it and, and working on the dream like every single day and that's really what it is, just every day applying something towards it to make it better. Um, as far as me, um, uh, with, with the cooking stuff turning into reality, um, like cooking was always therapeutic for me over the years. Like even when I was in music, like you know, like ASAP Rocky's a pescatarian, so like he he only eats fish. So I would go to the studio cook for him. Um, Bum B when he you know like different artists would come in town and I would cook for him. I always do like barbecues and stuff like that at my house. But because you know all the stuff that I do in the music, like you know, you come to a barbecue at my house, you got like the program director from every radio station, Flo Rida, Dwayne Wade. You know, like I got a lot of people, influential people, that would come to my house and. They're the ones that kind of like do the battery in my back, like you need to take the cooking stuff more seriously. Cause I would just, you know, I'm like, man, I'm doing this music. And they would tell me, man, you gotta take this more seriously. You gotta, you know. And then um, one day I went to um, to the studio to cook for um, Bun B of uh, Legendary UGK. And he sat me down for like 45 minutes and he wouldn't let me walk away until I said, I'm gonna commit and do this. And that was kind of like, that was kind of like the turning point in my life. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do it. And then I went, I did the research, put a business plan together, um, and I invested like 100000 into my business, and I just got it going, and it's, it's, it's been really dope, you know, since then. But, you know, it, it wasn't even something that I necessarily saw. It was things that people around me saw in me, and they helped bring it out, and I just followed through with it. Yeah, so um, so at, at, uh, at Knight Foundation, you know, as I mentioned, the, the 
the, the charge was, think about a new thing we should do in Miami. And so when we hit upon this idea of folks around entrepreneurship, trying to help build the ecosystem, the, uh, the first thought was, well, let's experiment to see if there's something there. You know, just just like what Don and Teach are saying, with in their and 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 what they and with their businesses, and so and and so in thinking about this initiative as a business, right? I mean, we're fortunate in Knight Foundation. The foundation, you know, the money's there, but it's, you know, what's something we can do that delivers impact? And so we did. We had three. We funded three things. We funded a uh, this panel discussion around Miami startup community without sort of saying that Knight Foundation was going to be funding uh, this. We just sort of had a, a gathering which I, uh, with a, a group just like this um, and just did a you know Q&A and just to sort of because I wanted to see who the crowd was who was coming out was there in was this an area of, of community interest is this something that people would want to be a part of because ultimately you know this is this is all driven by the community we're just providing sort of the supports and the fuel but it's a community effort um, and so we did that we also um, uh, uh, funded an effort, a, a, Ashoka was here, the, the social impact organization for a multi-day conference. We participated in that as well, once again, just to sort of see who the players were, who were the potential leaders in this effort, see the energy, and then we sent a couple of entrepreneurs on a, on a thing called Geeks on a Plane, which is this I thing. I know. You remember Geeks? It's, yeah. I've been going, yeah, but it's okay. coming up now, the yeah, Middle East and Middle everything. East. That's awesome. You guys look that up. Check it out, for sure. And we sent a couple of entrepreneurs on that. Yeah, I know. And but it's worth it. And it's, it's yeah, it's, and so what's that? If you have the money, it's worth it, yeah, well, the uh, and so and we sent a couple entrepreneurs from Miami on that, just and to get the feedback, right? And we can send some more too. Send me, send me, Matt. And okay. so, <laughs> <laughs> and so from those sort of three things, from both sort of seeing with our own eyes and getting feedback from others, we tried to determine if there was a there there, and this was a place to actually invest more dollars, and decided. There was, we were really impressed with the energy. It seemed this is an area of community interest for us to, to be engaged along with our work in the arts and journalism and innovation. And so then off we went, you know. Um, but again, the, the approach, and then we actually, we initially sort of whiteboarded, okay, if we think about a healthy ecosystem, what are the, what are the different components of it? And sort of whiteboarded that, you know, and sort of went through, and then began to sort of plug what we thought were gaps and then watch to see the response, right? And so what's been great is that so far, there's been enormous community response and enormous excitement, which is continually trying to sort of question, all right, does this make sense? Are we approaching this the right way? Are we thinking about the right things? But it started with experimenting. So uh, kind of a, uh, 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 gonna go into the Q&A, so um, actually going to ask, okay, I'll, actually, if you guys don't mind, just because I want to keep the mic up here, I'm going to ask you to come to the front to ask your question because we got to rework the mic situation. But if you have a question, go ahead and come over here by me, by the podium. Um, or you want me to just repeat? Come up here. You got to come up here and do it. So um, while we're doing that, I, just kind of to set the tone of what you're seeing happening, Don hit me up. What am I talking about? 30 minutes? How am I going to talk for 30 minutes? Teach hit me up. What's the preparation? What's the questions? There were 11 questions that we had pre-written. I asked two, they, asked, they answered all 11. <laughs> so every question got touched on from resources all the way up. And this is just how the natural and the flow of the conversation should go when you're speaking with entrepreneurs. It's the conversation that you don't hear, you know, I would have never thought that ASAP Rocky only ate fish. Like, <laughs> just being even stereotypical, however you may see it, I just would have never been like, oh, he only eats fish. I can see that in him. No, I'm thinking this man's probably eating a Mac. So you have to look at the things and realize this is how it works. These are the invaluable conversations that you really can't get. It's about, because these are normally the conversations we have in the green rooms. Because it's not normally the stuff you bring to the stage. The stage stuff is a lot, I and mean, we've seen the platform. The conversations are normally a lot more politically correct. And we were like, we want to kind of break that, but you got a comment? Let me get it right from you, teach. The comment that I wanted to make is somebody asked, what drove you to become an entrepreneur? When did you know that you wanted to take that leap? And one thing that I wanted to add it in that was touched on briefly is I feel that you truly need to have a passion for what you're doing. The money, as Don mentioned, is extremely important, 
But anyone who's an entrepreneur, one of the things that he will encounter without question is failure. And if the only motive that he have to do something is money, chances are stick to your nine to five job, stick in the corporate environment, you're a lot safer, your bills will get paid on time, your spouse, husband, wife, whoever loves you is going to be a lot more uh, understanding of what you're doing. If you don't have a passion for what you're doing, when you encounter the failures as an entrepreneur, you're not gonna get past it. So make sure that you have a passion and a drive for what you're gonna do, because you're gonna commit yourself to it in a good portion of your life. And if you're not passionate about it, you're not gonna make it. That's what I was gonna say, but <laughs> since you've already said it for me. I think I have some, a small thing to add to that. I think it's important to <coughs> define what success means to you. I asked myself this this year, like what, because people always will say, you're successful, I admire you, and I'm like, what? I don't have a Bentley or whatever you might think is successful. I don't have a yacht. I drive by Star Island every day and I am not going over there. That's not where I live. So I'm like, Dawn, what do you think is success? Like, is it a, is it a dollar figure? Is it, um, you know, because everybody thinks I'm successful. I think I'm successful, but I had to figure out why. Like at first I didn't think I was until I figured out what it was. And, and for me, success means setting a goal and reaching that goal. So I, wanted to create a business to sell shoes to women, feet, hurt, and heels. I did that. That was a successful, I completed that task. That's what I set out to do, and I was successful at doing it. I brought a product to market. That was a success. What's the next benchmark? You know, so that's how you gauge failure because I am never a failure personally. I never would take it personal, like if something doesn't work, that it's me. It's always, it's business as business. So I reached this benchmark or not, but that benchmark, happening or not, doesn't define me or doesn't define my entire business. So for instance, when I first started Flat Out, I said I'm gonna have 100 vending machines by the second year all over the country. I have two, it's like four and a half years. <laughs> so I could say I was not successful. I was successful in getting two out there, but have I reached that benchmark? Not yet, but have I reached another benchmark? to make the revenue and to keep my business going? Yes, I was. So I think it's really important for you to just define for you what success is, is for you so that when you, it is a perceived failure, it can be a lesson and you can take that and pivot and move forward. If I might, just to, yeah, just a quick, quick, quick follow, just to, just to build on that for I wholeheartedly agree. And just as a community, as I think we just need to work really hard and, and trying to sort of um, embrace a, a embrace the big failures, right? I mean, sort of in this, in, in entrepreneurship and what we're doing as a community, there are going to be failures because that's just inherent in taking risks and doing new things. And so sort of having a failure I don't know if you want to say failure except They say it fell forward or fell, yeah. you know, it's... Exactly, yeah, exactly. That's what I've heard, they just fell forward. Just, um, it doesn't work? Go to the Wholeheartedly. And just sort of as a community, sort of embracing that idea, I think, is really important. All right. Any more questions, guys? Go ahead. <coughs> so and yeah, that's, we got a line. Lined up. Oh, I didn't even see that. Yeah. They need to be over here for the feedback, right? If you can, step over here just because there's feedback on the mic. Hi, my name is LaSalle Sweetland. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, the question I had is um, for everyone on the panel. You guys started a business from scratch, from anything from, from your heels to your food truck. And everyone talked about research. How much research did you do regarding segmentation? Because as entrepreneurs, we always think when we come up with an idea that everyone's our customer. Mm -hmm. But not everyone's our customer. Mm -hmm. So how specific did you guys get with segmentation and to target who you were selling to to make sure you're having the maximum impact with the limited dollars you had to market? That, that, so, so that, that's part of the reason why I started a truck because I didn't want to invest a half a million dollars into a restaurant and not really know who my market was so the dope thing about the truck is <laughs> if I pull up on one block and it's not doing it I pack up and I go on another block <laughs> so it's like I'm, I've definitely um, benefited from having a truck and being mobile and moving around and, and being able to define who, um, who my audience is but that was part of, you know, the initial thought process when I wanted to jump out there and kind of take the risk. That's why I invested 100000 and not 500000 So this follow-up question is, where, where did you know to drive the truck? 
Where did I learn how to drive a truck? Where did you know? to stop? To stop? Did you just stop randomly, or you just um, you had, had an area that you wanted to specifically? Well, I kind of knew areas because I wanted to find places that had that was central. Because I have people that drive to my truck from Florida City, and I got people that drive my truck from West Palm. So I wanted something that was pretty central, but then I also wanted foot traffic, and you know, so Wynwood is a good area for me. So I tried it. You know, I tried there. I've tried several locations, and I've, I've I've been able to build a following. I utilize, you know, social media and stuff like that. So, um, you know, people know I'm mobile. So it's like if I say I'm parked up in front of this building right now, in the next, you know, hour, you, you know, you have like 40, 50 people waiting for the truck. So I've been able to, you know, build that. But you know, again, like I said, like that was that was part of the reason why I wanted to jump into a truck and not jump into like a five, ten year lease, and you know, be stuck with that. You know what I mean? Me, me personally. Okay. I can answer that for you too from a consumer product um, standpoint. It's really important to build out customer personas and profiles, especially when you're marketing and specifically if you're doing any online marketing, whether it be Google AdWords or AdRoll or Facebook. But um, so for me, I had to say, all right, who are the, from, I chose four. What are the top four markets of the women that I'm going after? Because really with flat out with a flat shoe and with my product is customizable, I could go to so many different Segments of business, I could be all over the place. So I said, let me just define it. So we have, you know, I segmented by, we have the girl that's like college age or between 18 to 24, party girl. This is what she's wearing flats for. Then we have 25 to 30, they're going to get their first job, they're going, they're getting married. What's their day look like? What do they eat? What do they do? What are they into? What are their interests? To the point where we break, I break down the profile to like, how do you get up in the morning? So knowing that the college student and the, and the mom, or the socialite who's <coughs> in her 40s and may just be doing charity work and going to events every night, they're, having, they're doing very different things. So being able to really break down the customer specifically to what time do they get up, what do they like, what other like-minded, what brands do they like, you know, what are they doing, it helps me to target them in a, from a marketing perspective. So even when I do my social media marketing, there's different messages at 7 a.m. because that's a certain person online at 7 a.m. Then somebody online at 11 a.m somebody online who's online at 11 p.m. My 7 a.m. person is usually not online at 11 p.m. So there's mm -hmm. different messages to target different customers. So building out a customer persona for all of the things that you do is really important to help you target your market and figuring out those the different messages and the different images and the different branding needed to reach that market. So that's how I target um, my groups. That was about $5,000 worth of free consultation <laughs> on social media marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's going up on the internet for free. That was awesome. I'm like, ooh, I need to sit, change my message in the morning. Joseph, we got four more questions. So, guys, we're, I'm going to ask just one panelist per question so we can wrap it up because of editing purposes. Go ahead. Uh, this question uh, is for Matt. Um, so, what things are working and what things are not working in further developing the um, tech or entrepreneurial um, ecosystem here in South Florida? Sure, so when we, we started, we sort of drew these areas, right, of uh, sort of spaces, if I'm not sure I need a place to go, where do I go to sort of put my, down my laptop, meet with my team? If I'm not sure I need funding or mentorship, where do I go for events and connection, right? Before it's really hard to plug in and connect with other entrepreneurs, how can we create those opportunities and those sorts of convenings? Similarly with learning opportunities and then access to talent, we sort of just, right? If we look now three years later, like when we first started, there wasn't really a place to go. If you're an entrepreneur, you want to connect with us. Because that's why we funded a place called the Lab Miami in Wynwood, right? Just to start that, because there really wasn't. Now, suddenly, you know, two years later, you know, we, have, we work across the street. We have the urban studios here, you know, bureaus expanding, pipelines expanding, Ecotech Visions has launched. It's now what, two years in, year and a half in. Um, we've got, you know, building.co is open, Cambridge Innovation Center. So it feels like there's an area that's sort of arrived, right? And we don't need to be playing a role in trying to fuel that because it's just sort of, it's happening, right? Similarly, in terms of maker spaces. And I would also add events. I think right now there are lots of opportunities um, for connection. But go ahead, you have a follow up. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add a point onto that. Um, sure. So, like, like, what can we do to further develop, you know, like, uh, the funding 
ecosystem yep. to support the entrepreneurs and also like like what are you guys doing to bring in more tech talent uh, you know from from like san francisco so, from new york city yep. dc virginia yeah i think you talked people. about this matt when you told us about building an environment and it attracts them so you might want to touch on that point that you made before Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So, I mean, fundamentally for all of this to work, you know, it has to be built on, you know, talent and funding have to be there, right? And sort of where our head is at right now is really sort of around three things. As I mentioned, we have some, some parts of the ecosystem are really, are developing really well. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, in terms of funding and talent, we're seeing lots of examples of that improving in a really significant way. I mean, don't forget, and we see companies here that from early stage companies that are beginning to get funding to, I mean, we've got crazy cases of companies that are getting some of the biggest funding rounds. Last year, one company got the biggest funding round in the U.S., or one of them, here, right? So, magically, yeah. And so we are seeing examples of that, but there's still needs, to your point, there's still so much more to do, right? So where, we're th so where our head is at right now as we think about spinning forward, continuing to build ways where it's easier for you as an entrepreneur to get funding, continuing to work on ways around finding talent, and there are multiple different, whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's a program that just launched at Ecotech Visions around, uh, around uh, building coding skills, to uh, just last night I was at the, the WinCode pitch day, um, which an extraordinary group of 30 people just finishing the nine-week program, highly talented, to bringing people in through programs like Venture for America, for example. But then the, the third leg, and to me the most important leg, is, is that I think as, as a community, as we continue to work to build a tech ecosystem, is to continuing to find ways that we connect across the community in ways that we haven't, right? Because you know, innovation comes from the places you least expect, right? The big ideas don't come, are, you know, are, not, are in all likelihood, you know, are not gonna be coming out of, you know, the, um, you know, the, the university classroom. I don't know, maybe that's a crazy statement. But I think it's, I think, and I'll like that it's not, right? It's, it, it is, you know, it's dawn, you know, that evening when she's thinking about, you know, you know heels, right? It's, you know, it's Jim when he can't make a, a sell the vase, you know, or the glass or whatever, right? And thinking of those. And so I think the more that we can connect across the community and create on-ramps where someone with that idea who wants to find a mentor can find it, who wants to try and get funding, who has an idea that's sort of ready to be, be fundable, has a way to do that. I think that's where you know, we'll find you know, even greater success. And certainly for us, that's where our head is at as we head into 2016. That's a long answer. I hope that no, sheds that's something. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Glamour. And then get on to the Knight Foundation um, newsletter because, you know, there's lots of great events and I definitely read it and put stuff on my yeah, calendar, yeah. but Thanks. that's how you'll stay up on everything going on, okay. like, in the community. It's just being on that. Mail what do you list. feel about the, uh, Hold on, hold on. Guys, we have to Sorry. conserve our questions. So Can I say one thing really quickly? I know we're tired, I know we're tired. But just one thing I think we have to, the, the awesome thing about what we're all doing here in Miami is that it's all on us, right? And so it's just so the moment you see a problem, just focus on solving it, right? I mean, the fun thing is that none of the stuff is sort of created necessarily. So, you know, when we see an opportunity, it's just, just sort of do it. You know, I think the more we can have a community of not seeking permission or wonder, you know, just of just doing, the better. Go ahead, Melissa. Good morning. My, na my name is, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. My name is Melissa Hunter Davis. I'm with Sugar Cane Magazine. Um, what I've always noticed is that the most successful entrepreneurs always have a, a marketing background. Like marketers could part the Red Sea and it will get done. People will walk across and be perfect. So for those of us who don't have a marketing background, can you recommend some tools or books to help us build that toolbox? Yeah, I can give you some really great resources. Um, there's, a new, there's a new platform out called kitcrm.com. It's amazing, a customer relationship management tool, which basically is like a digital marketing manager. Like, I had a team of six people at the beginning of this year. I have a team of zero now. I definitely, well me, I'm one. But I have, you know, I have now using, you know, I call them robot people, like all these different automation tools. And then I have people that I outsource and that I use, you know, on an independent contractor basis. But, um, you know, I do these different automation tools like Kit and, and Buffer that help with your content management and um, 
busy.io that automates your um, emails that go to your customers. It really, you know, it, it, my background is marketing. I, that's what I've been doing for 16 years. That's what I did at Nationwide, and it's amazing the tools that are out now. So definitely, definitely try out Kit, mm -hmm. and then um, a book. So a great book just to start out with, and even though it's not totally marketing based, but it's just great for any business. It's Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, who's the CEO mm -hmm. of Zappos. Just a really good book on um, just building your core values of your company and figuring out like who you are as, as a company and, and how to go from there. Um, I think that's like the favorite one on the top of my list right now. And then The Hard Things About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, also a really great book that I just finished. And um, there's another one that's really good. Oh, God, I can't think of it right now. But I'll look on my phone, and I'll tell you in a minute. So let them. Or you can just be teach and just cook for all the celebrities, and then just get pushing on cooking at your something. But you know, just to, just to, uh, I think we need to do like maybe have Don give a talk or something on this because I'm how to how to be a better marketing person. Well, yeah, because the cost. Oh, of, yeah, you of got that next session for digital grass. Literally, yeah. I went down from spending like six thousand a month on people to do things to now probably three hundred a month on automation tools that are way more effective. Yeah. I don't even know if that's a good thing to say, but it's just realistic. I mean, I've definitely that's kept real. my burn rate down drastically. And we're seeing that in, you know, it, it sort of across the board in terms of the cost to go and right? I mean, before if you were launching a new venture, you might have to have like a server or something, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can use Dropbox and Box for document storage. You know, they're using things, that so was it, Elance? To yeah, hiring, I do, know, I use uh, Upwork is Upwork one that I use. Now. I Upwork. use Upwork. And, or, yeah. you know, in terms of marketing, you know, in terms of the social media platform. And one thing we talk a lot about at Knight Foundation is you will have people come to us saying, you know, I want to create this new sort of platform with X, Y, and Z. And our first question, as always, is have you first explored using existing platforms to push out what you're trying yeah. to do? You know, because, and it's free. Mm -hmm. and so the costs are so low, so the more, we yeah. should have you give a I would love to, to Matt, and I would love to go to Geeks on a Plane. Okay, plug, plug. all right. Uh, um, <laughs> the last, one more thing is everybody also look up Google Accelerate for Entrepreneurs, it's a program. You can apply to be, a, I, I actually graduated and completed it, but it, it's a, um, it teaches you Google for free. It's a 12 week program, it's a lot of homework, but it teaches you the, all the ins and outs of um, online marketing and just the digital marketing using the Google tools and using HubSpot, and they give you a free HubSpot account, which if you know anything about it, is that's an expensive um, application. They give it to you six months for free to grow your business online, and it's an amazing resource. You have to just go on there, tell for entrepreneurs, apply, it's free. Very time consuming, but I learned, I mean, I learned, I'm a growth hacker now, like somehow I'm a growth hacker, so. Well, y'all got about $10,000 worth of content yeah. in the first <laughs> hour. This is. What was that? Google Accelerate for Entrepreneurs. Um, you just Google, if you just Google, Google Accelerate. <laughs> It'll pop right up. Google, Google. Google, Google. It'll, Google, Google, and it'll <laughs> pop right up. All right, Stephen. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking specifically, I know that uh, both Teach and Don touched on how you leverage your networks to, uh, to your advantage. I know that you leverage your network to get funding. Obviously, you're leveraging your network because you know a lot of celebrities, and they help you push your product. Um, getting into more, I guess, of the intricate details, how do you leverage your network to grow your business? Like, for instance, I know faith, like, one of the problems I had is I want to do things organically because it's cheaper. Um, so when you go to Facebook, trying to get somebody to, try to get your friends to invite everybody one by one to, to like your Facebook page is, is a big ask. So is there anything that you can do to, to work around that? Um, have, is, is there a particular type of verbiage that you use? Uh, what, what is it that you're doing to get your friends to help you grow your business? I answer that too. I mean, me, me personally, again, I, I, I go back to what I said before, like, I, I feel like there's no, for me personally, there's no cookie cutter approach to that, right? Because, like, like, what worked for me is that I've been great at, from the beginning of my career, at building great relationships with people, and, you know, I don't really ask for much, so, like, when I do ask for things, you know, they're, they're very impactful, um, but everybody, relationships are not the same, um, so... I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have it. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if there's a particular way. Well, that's going to come up, actually. Your network is your net worth. All that's, that's another you, session. Like, Teach is in my network. And I'm a huge supporter of Chef Teach House of Match because 
it's an amazing, it's, the food's amazing. If it was just my friend and the food's not good, I'd be like, okay, I don't know. But for him, it's like him doing things like catering events, having barbecues over his house where he invites his friends, but his friends are influential people. Then you have a network of people that want to see you win, number one, and they believe in the product. So with you, I don't know what you're selling or doing, but give it to them. Make them a believer. So the first thing that I did was, when I first came out flat out, I'm like, hey, you know, I have an idea for these flats. I'm gonna give you some. Because when I realized that my customer acquisition cost is less than my product production, is more than product production cost, it costs me less money to give away a free pair of shoes than it does to go out and pay to market. So give your friends whatever you're doing. If you're cooking, make them a meal. Say, if you like my meal, post about it, support me when I come out. I have a shoe product, give it away. I'm right now, plug, freeflatouts.com. I'm giving away flatouts on my website, a certain model, because I feel like if I give them to you, you'll love them, you'll buy them again. It will work that way. And at the same time, I'm building my database. So there's creative ways to do this. You give away something free, but I get three emails per product, which means I have three leads that I can continue to market to, and I'm building my database. So to answer your question, to get your friends to support, Get them on board by involving them in some <coughs> way, giving them a product, letting them sample it. I had a launch event. I invited everybody to come to an event, free food, try out these flat outs. That, get them engaged. It's not just asking them to like something. We're saturated with likes and pages and engage. Go back to like organic human content. Hold on, hold on, Don. We, we let them in for free okay. today. Okay. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm about to go ask for a collection plate like we in church. <laughs> Don is going to do another session with Digital Grass. We have just confirmed that with LaToya and Alicia. We will release the dates later today. It's already in the book, so it's confirmed with the president. We're good to go. But, but, I, but I, think, I think to add to that, though, too, I think to add to that, I mean, I guess the, the answer would be, you know, hard work is cool, but smart work is better. So just, just, just work smart. Like, you got you to gotta utilize your relationships and things in your network, but you just got to just work smart. Last question. Steven. Two Stevens. It's a great name. <laughs> uh, I'm all about literacy and uh, empathy in the community, and uh, I think it's also uh, core values that uh, Digital Grass represents. Um, my question was, how do we um, make that scalable in the community? Because we're so diverse and uh, and different, but we, we all are one community here in Miami. Mm. What's the real question? Uh, what's, how, how do we scale literacy and empathy community-wise as entrepreneurs and makers? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we want to we solve big problems, right, as entrepreneurs, right? This is the journalist, so he has the answer. <laughs> You know, I think that, the, to me, as we think about the sort of community that we're building together, right, um, as, bless you, as we, as we, um, we want to, ultimately, the great prize that we're all after is sort of creating this pay it forward network, right, where we're creating environment where sort of each one of us can best do what we want to do and become stars doing it, right? But not only become stars, become the, the future funders and mentors of the next group coming up, right? And so that's where I think we find real success <coughs> and have sort of a multiplier effect in the community when you create that sort of pay it forward network. And part of it is just sort of a, a cultural value. It's something that as we think about Miami, this is just the way Miami operates, right? As people are, are striving and hustling, there's always a thought about how can I sort of mentor. Look on my website. <laughs> ah, love it. Love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Flatoutofhills.com. Was that planned? No, that was but awesome. it came That wasn't. Plan. That was great. <laughs> so, love it. I, I think, and another thing, just to kind of close in and add to what Matt said, contact Knight Foundation, contact Digital Grass, and tell us what your vision is to actually make that happen. Because that's one of the biggest things. If you see a problem or you have a passion, what's the solution? And then find people that'll support you coming up with that solution. That's so, yeah. spot on. I couldn't agree more. How do you more. think yes, we yeah. can scale uh, empathy my, and my, literacy? Well, basically, that's basically provides them like square to the um, entrepreneurs in the uh, area of, obviously, Liberty City yeah. who don't do digital. There's people, or, there's, um, but they're, they're there. Payments. Basically, yeah. bring e payments to the um, communities that are 
underserved. Oh, I they see don't what you're saying. Accept uh, digital payments now. I see what you're saying now. Yeah, I totally misunderstood that question. And yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, let's think. Within us that are already in it. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, right. Massmedia.us. But basically, I'm trying to bring the understanding of the literacy about the, ah. the digital world. Well, I was thinking reading literacy, right? Me so, too. Digital, okay, yeah. You know, so digital the digital divide in, in the entrepreneurial We got to take him to the things with eco So let's think about what could we do if we were to do something, right? Next week's Thanksgiving, so we'll all, you know. But if to think in the sense, okay, if we were to do something next week, right? Or if we were to do something tomorrow mm -hmm. to what try and be? begin to make a dent in that, what would that be? Right, uh -oh. and so and you don't have to. I'm not trying to put you on the spot and answer now, but think, I would just let's think about that. Right, what can we do in Liberty City to try and as it relates to digital literacy, you know, tomorrow? I would say. Uh, uh, nope. No, but listen, no. in the you, night, you you, you, you figure it out. Challenge. He can apply <laughs> for that. <laughs> yeah. and but make the, a difference. but the thought so is. Hold on, hold on, guy. Hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. We're we'll gonna have to get you in the green room afterwards for our. First set of professors, please give a round of applause for us.